Last Sunday morning, many of you may be tuned in, when we were all eagerly awaiting the Super Bowl kickoff, Tim Russert was interviewing the senior senator from Massachusetts on Meet the Press. And Tim asked Senator Kennedy how he thought the Eagles would do that day. <laughs> and of course, the senator predicted that within hours they'd be vanquished by the Patriots. But then Tim, who comes from Buffalo, <laughs> showed his true Boston colors by saying emphatically to Senator Kennedy, I was talking about the Boston College Eagles, 20 and 0, undefeated, undefeated, he said. Of course, they were defeated that day, I think. <laughs> Tim owes his passionate BC loyalties in part to his son, Luke, who's now a freshman at BC, and we're very grateful to Luke for giving his dad a special reason for visiting Boston today. Tim Russert, as we all know, is one of America's most respected journalists, and we're deeply honored to have him here today. Thank you, Tim. We all know him from his weekly appearance in our living rooms on Sunday mornings when he brings us his special brand of fairness and intelligence to his weekly interviews with the movers and shakers of the world. At a time when there never seems to be enough reliable information and real conversation in the media, Tim serves up both of these scarce commodities week after week with great insight, wit, and humor. And I have no doubt that Tim is the kind of journalist for whom President Kennedy would have had the highest respect. Sander Van Oker, who was one of Tim's NBC predecessors, once asked President Kennedy soon after the Cuban Missile Crisis when tensions between the press and the White House were running high, is it true that you're reading more and enjoying it less? <laughs> JFK famously replied, even though we wish they sometimes didn't write what they write, there isn't any doubt that we could not have a free society without a very, very active press. I got to know Tim as his next door neighbor in Washington, and as a government official, I was always amazed at how much he knew that I didn't know. And I was always curious to find out just what was in that mysterious big packet that was delivered to his house every Saturday <laughs> afternoon by an NBC courier. Of course, like everyone else, I had to wait until Meet the Press on Sunday to morning to find out. And since Tim took over the helm of Meet the Press in December 1991, it has become the most watched Sunday program in America, the most quoted news program in the world. Now, in its 57th year, Meet the Press is the longest-running program in the history of television. Tim joined NBC News in 1984 after serving as chief counsel to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York, whom he had helped elect in 1976. And I think one of the many examples of the respect Tim has achieved in covering politics and public affairs over the years is that he has moderated more debates among candidates for governor, the Senate, and the presidency than I think anyone else. He's been showered with awards bearing the names of great journalists with whom he can be justly compared, including the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television journalism, the Annenberg Center's Walter Cronkite Award, the Alan Newharth Award for excellence in journalism, and the David Brinkley Award for excellence in communications. And last year, Reader's Digest named him America's best interviewer, and in 2001, the Washingtonian magazine called him the most influential journalist in Washington and Meet the Press the most interesting and important hour on television. But Tim has never forgotten his roots in the working class Irish neighborhoods of Buffalo, and he has written movingly about what he learned from his father in his recent book, Big Russ and Me, Father and Son, Lessons of Life. I recommend it to all. To moderate our conversation with Tim this evening, we're very fortunate to have with us another leading figure in Washington journalism, Linda Wertheimer, a National Public Radio's senior national correspondent. For more than three decades, Linda has given us her clear-eyed analysis and thoughtful reporting of all the major issues of our time. For 13 years, she served as host of NPR's All Things Considered, during which the show grew to more than 10 million listeners and one of the top five radio news programs in America. In 1976, she became the first woman to anchor network coverage of a presidential convention, and since then, she's anchored 10 conventions in 12 elections. 
Linda has received numerous awards for her reporting, including the Silver Baton Award for her coverage of the 1994 Republican takeover of Congress, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting Award for her programs on the Iran-Contra congressional hearings, the American Women in Radio and Television Award for a series entitled Illegal Abortion, and the American Legion Award for her coverage of the Panama Canal treaties. Please join me then in welcoming Tim Russert and Linda Wertheimer to the stage of the Kennedy Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm, I'm so impressed. I, whoa. Start off with a bang here. <laughs> Well, rescue the, the beautiful blue glass, which actually didn't break. Um, I, I wanted to say that uh, it, it, is a, it really is an honor to be here, to be in Boston and to be at the Kennedy Library and, uh, and to be here with Tim. Um, I first met Tim when he was covering, when he was working for Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And he was famous, I'm sure he'll want me to tell you, for his absolutely dead-on imitation of Senator Moynihan, <laughs> to the extent that uh, a number of times, I mean, there are all kinds of stories about the senator calling someone up and having this person say, can it, Russert? I don't have time for this, and hanging up. <laughs> it is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask him to do it today, unless maybe we, you know, we feel that we need him to channel <laughs> But we might, we might wait and see if he could sort of channel the senator on Social Security or something. <laughs> but um, I'd like to begin with, uh, with one of the things that Tim is much more famous for, I think, particularly among journalists and certainly, if le at least indirectly, among all of his listeners and, and uh, viewers, and that is that he comes to his encounters with America's leaders so very well prepared. You are famous for your homework. Uh, you very rarely ever are caught out. And I'm, I'm wondering how you prepare for a program, what you read, who you call, what do you do? Uh, it really does flow all back to uh, the way I grew up in terms of the way I approach life and approach uh, Meet the Press. Uh, John mentioned my dad, Big Russ quit school in the 10th grade to go fight in World War II and 60 years ago last month was in this terrible plane crash and survived and spent six months in the hospital then came home and started a second mission to raise and educate his four kids and there was an expectation that he had of us and it was reinforced so much by my mother who insisted I'm sorry about this microphone I think it's got to be closer to you then closer. farther away okay. uh, we literally would sit around the kitchen table, the four of us, and we couldn't trade our pencil for a fork until all the homework was done. <laughs> and there were, no, there were no play dates. There were no play dates. We went on the street and played and came back in, and that was it. And then what happened was that school was all reinforced. Sister Mary Lucille, whose nickname, ironically, was Sister Mary Kennedy because of her devotion to President Kennedy, summoned me to the front of the room by saying, Timothy, we need an alternative vehicle to channel your excessive energy. <laughs> and she started a school newspaper and made me the editor. And one of the first things we did was wrote a special edition about the tragic assassination of President Kennedy. But because of my work on that paper, I was admitted to Canisius Jesuit High School, far on the other side of the city, where I encountered Father John Sturm, the prefect of discipline, who put me against the lockers for some perceived indiscretion. And I said, Father, please, don't you believe in mercy? He said, Russert, mercy's for God. I delivered justice. <laughs> so by then, I had a pretty good sense about discipline, preparation, accountability. And I, through Canisius High School, four years of Latin, college, three years of law school, uh, I take those lessons and apply them to what I do every day. And so at, uh, I get up at 5.30. I read six or seven newspapers. Uh, either I'm on the Today Show or watch the first half hour of the Today Show. Um, go to work, call all my correspondents to various debates, and then start calling people I know and respect. I will call people at conservative think tanks, liberal think tanks, people who are smarter than I am in particular areas and say, explain this to me. Because what I want to be able to do is understand it in a way that I can explain it, explain it in a meaningful and understandable way to the viewers, people who work hard all week long, 
who don't have the benefit of or access to these uh, very smart, intelligent people. When I took over Meet the Press, Linda, Lawrence Spivak uh, had been retired from it. He founded Meet the Press. And I, I went to have lunch with him. And I said, Larry, when you founded the program 57 years ago now, what was the mission? And how did you prepare yourself? He said, learn as much as you can about your guest and his and her position on the issues and take the other side. And do that persistently, aggressively, but always in a civil way. Do it to Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, and people will watch every week and respect you for what you do. And I've just tried to apply all those lessons of life from mom, dad, sister Lucille, father Sturm, and Lawrence Spivak, and, uh, and it's on display every Sunday morning. Do you think of it as, uh, as, as pinning your guests down uh, in, in a non-adversarial way, of course, but, but trying to pin them down? I don't think you can make tough decisions unless you answer tough questions. If you back and read um, presidential histories, which I love to do in presidential biographies, the staff will say, we, as much as we didn't like it, we welcome news conferences because we finally got the president to focus and come to closure. You're going to be asked about Social Security. You're going to be asked about Iraq. You're going to be asked about exit strategy. You need an answer. And so what has happened is that the politicians have adopted a lot of media training and spin control and things like this. And so it takes three or four questions in order to elicit information. I, this past Sunday, I had Charles Grassley, the Republican senator from Iowa, who's chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. The Social Security bill will go through his committee. And he was talking about Professor Bush going around and educating the American people. And I said, well, Senator, the president has said he's for private or personal accounts. But you know that they will not solve the financial problems confronting Social Security. In fact, they may add to it. He said, right. And I knew then that he was willing to be a little more candid. I said, so you know, Senator, flattering him somewhat, that if a bill is to pass, he will have to include for the remainder of the century, not current recipients, but out years, benefit reductions or tax increases. He said, yes. I said, would the president sign such a bill? It would have private accounts, but benefit reductions and tax increases? He said, yes, he'd sign it. Well, I knew then the White House was breaking China. I was going to yeah. say, ballistic. But it was an honest, <laughs> truthful answer, and it's important now in terms of the debate that we have that benchmark. So it's not gotcha. It's not trying to get people. What it's trying to do is draw them out with an honest answer so the American people say, now that's interesting. The Republican chairman saying that's where it's going to go. He, he got, almost went beyond that. He, he basically said that the president was behaving, I mean, I'm, I'm, he didn't use this uh, example, but like John the Baptist, he's out there crying in the wilderness about how Social Security needs help. But I, Senator Grassley said, will figure out how to help it. Yeah, he said, Mr. President, you don't have to send a specific legislation. We'll take care of that. But, he went on, we cannot do it unless it's bipartisan. And I haven't heard that word, bipartisan, consensus, common ground, in a very long time. Now, obviously, we all watched last Sunday as part of our homework for <laughs> this event, right? Social Security, the, the president's plan, is, one, is, is a departure for the president in that he has always tried, I think, to go for things that can be explained in a short declarative sentence. This program, whatever it is, because he hasn't quite you know, laid it out for us yet, cannot be explained very easily. Now, both you and he have that problem because you're supposed to say something about it on television, which, like radio, cannot be reread. How do you do that? You work at it. Um, and the reason that I started using graphics on the show when I took over 13 years ago was that people said, one of the executives at NBC said, why are you showing graphics on the screen? That's 1950s TV. I said, what was wrong with 50s TV? <laughs> it was black and white and understandable. At the 2000 election, when I pulled out my little board and wrote Florida, 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 <laughs> I was trying to explain to people that the Electoral College was in play and that Florida was in play, and this is how it was going to be decided. And Tom Brokaw kept saying, well, we got six states. I said, Tom, Florida, this is it. No matter what happens in Florida, that's the winner. So with Social Security, what the president is saying is that the, first he said it was a crisis, now he said it's a problem. But he's suggesting the way to fix it 
is private or personal accounts. Because he understands, I believe, that to the next generation, they're much more comfortable with that prospect than is the Roosevelt generation, uh, my dad's generation. I also think there's a political motivation in this. Uh, Roosevelt, where I grew up, is still sainted because of Social Security. He made that program available for my grandma and grandpa and for my dad and my mom. And I believe that there are a lot of Republicans who believe that if George Bush is the one who can be responsible, the father of private or personal accounts, the next generation will be watching the market every day and be much more inclined to be Republican than they would be Democrat in terms of the Social Security system that they're going to inherit. Our job is to peel it away and say, this is the situation. There are 40 million people on Social Security now. When the baby boomers retire, and we're getting old. It's hard to admit, but we're getting yeah, old. Yeah, we're getting there. There's going to be 80 million. And people used to be on Social Security for, Roosevelt was genius. He set the eligibility age of Social Security at 65. Why? That was life expectancy. If you made it to 65, you're on the program a few months, and that was it. See you later. <laughs> now, expectancy is 78, 79, 80. So there's going to be 40 million to 80 million people, and they're going to be on the system for 15 years. Something has to give. If you do nothing, you'd have to reduce benefits or increase the payroll tax, unless there's a dramatic immigration boom with a lot more workers into the, into the workforce paying the payroll tax. Uh, you can also have reductions in COLA increases or make them more accurate, depending on who you want to believe. There's lots of ways to tweak this. But the bottom line is Democrats, Republicans will privately acknowledge something must be done. The resistance of the president is going to be on the private accounts because they don't want to have private accounts drawing money that would go to the payroll tax into the Social Security Fund into the private accounts. And the Democrats will say, I think justifiably, what if the private accounts tank? Then what's left for this person? You're going to tell them to live on two-thirds of what they were going to expect as they turn 65, 70, 75, or 80. On the other hand, Democrats, I think, will have a responsibility to say, we're against private or personal accounts, but we believe something must be done. And I think if I explain it in that way, and I'll use some charts and graphs, um, I'll, I'll, I can make a, 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 a dent in it. <laughs> I remember Ross Perot. Where is he? 1992. <laughs> <laughs> he came on Meet the Press. He said, I can balance the budget. It was $400 billion. I can balance the budget without breaking a sweat. I said, Mr. Pro, you identified the problem. You've defined the problem. But now it's Meet the Press. You're running for president. You're ahead of George Bush and Bill Clinton in the polls. Let's find the solution. Let's go under that hood that you're so proud of and tell me, what are you going to do? What programs are you going to cut? What taxes are you going to increase? Now then, if you had told me you were going to ask me these kinds of questions, I mean, you're have a re you're supposed to tell me. I said, this is meet the press. I'm not supposed to. I'm not going to warn you what's coming up. And it went back and forth, back and forth. He said, I hope you think you proved your manhood. I said, this has nothing to do with manhood. I mean, so after the show was over, I had to get out of shuttle flight to, uh, from Washington, New York, and the flight attendant ran down the aisle. She said, my God, that interview with Ross Perot. What do you think of Ross Perot? I said, ma'am. I never comment about my guests or their performance on the show, but I'm endlessly curious as a viewer, as a voter, as a flight attendant, what do you think of Ross Perot? And she paused. He said, he, he strikes me as the kind of guy that would never return his tray table to the upright position. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a bond between us because something very similar happened to me when I interviewed Ross Perot. It was before he, you know, it was before we really began to think that perhaps he was a very interesting candidate, but please, God, don't let him anywhere near the White House. Um, it, was a, it was an interview in which he, um, I asked him an uncomfortable question about something that he, he had done when he was in business to attempt to influence the Congress to give him an astronomic tax refund. You'll remember this because it was, it was Albert who broke the story in the mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal, and the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee was forced to resign. It was a big brouhaha. Albert right? Hunt. Right. And uh, <coughs> so I brought this up to him, and he started screaming at me. Is this really a radio program? What is this radio program? This could be anything. And he just went on and on and on. He just completely lost it, and I'm sitting there sputtering. It was, your staff, by the way, says that's as close 
to being disco- discombobulated as you have ever been. Well, I was just watching him, and he kept saying, go ahead, go ahead, keep going. And I, and I said, Mr. Pro, I just asked you the question. <laughs> he, said, are, he said, are you finished? I said, yes, I'm finished. Go ahead. I said, I'm finished. <laughs> It was, uh, it was a remarkable morning. And that, that piece of tape obviously survives. They get it out and play it at every Oh, it's there. Every it's occasion. There. It's, uh... Mine, too. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I thought was, uh, was interesting about the... But my, fa- my real favorite, Shogi Berra. Yeah? Oh, this is the best. You got time for this? Sure. All right. <laughs> All my life, I want my boyhood idol. Everybody liked Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. I loved Yogi Berra, this little Italian kid from St. Louis. And I dreamt of getting his autograph. I never did because we were sitting in the nosebleed sections. And finally, I've gotten to meet him now. And I've been to his museum library in New Jersey. And I always wanted to ask him, did he really say all the things they say he said? So I was there <laughs> last month doing this thing with uh, Roger Clemens and Whitey Ford and everybody. I said, Yogi, did you? He said, like what? I said, okay. It is said that you walked into a pizzeria, and the waiter said, Yogi, you want a pizza? And you said, yes. And he said, you want to cut in six or eight slices? And you said, six, I can't eat eight. (laughs) (laughs) And Yogi said, yeah. (laughs) So Whitey Ford says, Tim, hold on. Let me tell you. True story about Yogi Berra. We're playing the Chicago White Sox. I was out pitching. I hadn't been out the night before with Mickey Mantle, and I probably shouldn't have been pitching. But I first pitch Nellie Fox, single to the right field. Second pitch, Louis Aparicio, single left field. Two pitches, runners on first and second. Third pitch, I hit Minnie Minoso. Bases loaded with three pitches. Fourth pitch, Ted Klazuski, big power hitter, grand slam. Four pitches, four nothing White Sox. Casey Stangle, the Yankee manager, came from the dugout. Yogi came behind home plate and took his mask off. And Casey said, hey, Yogi, says, why do you have a stuff tonight? Yogi said, how the hell did I? I haven't caught a ball yet. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make it up. This is a... So politicians are easy, let me tell you. This is... <laughs> I think that is right. I think that's right. Uh, one of the ways in which you, uh, you, you go after politicians, in the nicest possible way, of course, is you quote either, you often quote them, things they've said, you quote things that other people have said, you hold up these quotes and then you ask them to react to them. Um, it's, it seems to me that that's a relatively genteel way of not being the, the bad guy. Yes. Uh, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be the person saying, you know, uh, I believe this and it disagrees with you. And what I also found, Linda, is it, it really does define the debate and limit the scope. The reason, when I first started, I had Dick Armey, who was one of the Republican leaders in the House, and I said, Mr. Armey, you said such and such. He said, no, I didn't. And I didn't have, wasn't using graphics. I said, yes, you did. I said, he said, where? I said, right here. I, pulled, I said, in a press release. He said, it's in writing? I said, yeah. He goes, okay. <laughs> I, I realized then, why don't I short circuit that and just put the quote on the board immediately and not have to be extracting teeth like a root canal. At, to this day, when I put something on the board and say, you know, Senator, you said three years ago that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction or whatever it was. I, to this day, I'm not amazed that more of them don't say, you know, Tim, you're right. I absolutely did say that. And you know what? I've changed my mind. I've talked to people. I've studied the issue. I've been, over, I've been on the ground. And I really have changed my mind on, what do you say? No, you haven't? <laughs> There's no follow-up. And it, as opposed to, well, you know, what I really said there is, is that I, I had no intention of voting for it. But, you know, I, having no intention is different than actually, you know, and they start splicing it. And you say, oh, my God. And the viewer's saying, please, just fess up. Tell the truth. And I think there's such a yearning for authenticity and for straight shooting that people would sit back and applaud saying, good for him. Yeah, he, he changed his mind. We all do. At one point you accused Senator Kerry. This was in, I think, the um, accused is a strong word. But you suggested to Senator Kerry in the kind of exit interview after the, uh, just this year. Yeah. You asked him if he was still arguing with himself about whatever it was. But the notion that that he would be arguing with himself, I think, was it? A- I think it was his response to the Swift Boat veterans, perhaps. Mm-hmm. He was very candid about that. I, and that was, that was kind of a nice moment. He said, you know, I, I, I regret not being more aggressive and forceful about that. 
It was something, I, I want so many of these things. I, I talked to my, my dad is so good. My dad is 81 years old, big Russ now. And I have, my mom, dad, and three sisters all live in Buffalo. And they're not involved in the media, politics, anything. They all have real jobs. <laughs> they have <laughs> truck drivers and cab drivers and bankers. And, and um, they are the cheapest, most accurate focus group you could ever have. <laughs> and they just tell you the unvarnished truth. And my dad said, I don't get this. You know, this guy went to one of those fancy schools and he, he volunteered, went to Vietnam, and he got shot at, and he had these medals, and the other guy didn't. Why is he the one being criticized? This is my dad's instinct. And, and I, I always marveled at, and this was early on, as soon as he heard it. And I figured, okay, here comes the Kerry campaign. They're going to whack back really aggressively saying, just a second here, there's only one decorated veteran in this race, and if you want to take us on, let's go. And it didn't happen. I think there was a, a sense, a hope that the issue would fade away. And, and I think it was used as a metaphor for a lot of other things that they tried to define Senator Kerry. In any event, it was kind of a nice moment when he said um, it's one of the regrets mm -hmm. he had. All right, all right. Um, you, you quoted uh, George Bush uh, on the Social Security show, President Bush, uh, saying that, uh, talking about private accounts, privatizing Social Security, and it was from the 70s. Yes. From his, uh, from his congressional campaign, campaign, which he lost. And when I interviewed him in 1999, when he was thinking of running for president, same thing. He repeated it. It's something that's been in his head a long time about Social Security, transforming it into some form of private accounts. You know, it's interesting. A lot of Democrats, including Bill Clinton and Al Gore, have had this idea of Social Security Plus, where you would have designated accounts, but they wouldn't come out of the payroll tax. So you'd never uh, interrupt that revenue stream, which I think would probably have a pretty good chance of passing right now. But clearly, is, is 30 years ago, President Bush has had this idea of private or personal accounts regarding Social Security uh, very much as part of his political portfolio. And that was one of the things that I loved about that show was that to give us that, that moment in which we realized that, you know, when George Bush gets his teeth into an idea, you know, he gets his teeth into an idea. And I didn't, I, you know, I didn't remember that, and I was fascinated to hear it. Um, at one that's, point, a, that's such an important point. If you watch this last campaign, if and people see it through their own prism, you know, Democrats would say, "Oh, there goes Bush again," and Republicans would say, "Go get him, Mr. President," and vice versa. But the one thing that Bush, as a candidate, was every single day was consistent. Now, as a journalist, it's repetitive because he'll say, "I was right about Iraq then, and I'm right now." And the world's better off because Saddam Hussein is gone, and it, it's your money, not the government's, and we're going to cut your taxes. And he'd say it every day, and, he, and people cheer and whoop it up. The Democrats seem to have a difficult time reducing the message into that form. It's much more nuanced, much more complex, if you will. And it's quite interesting to me to see, as we cover politics, are we able to give each of those candidates an opportunity to put forward their views uh, in an in ever-changing and quicker media environment. When John Kerry had a chance to lay out his views in presidential debates 90 minutes long, by all accounts, even Republicans, he did extremely well. And I think it was a valuable lesson for the Democrats to realize that w when they're attacked or criticized, they have to respond, lesson one. But lesson two is get their views in, to a point where they can be articulated in a way that people understand them, nod their head and say, yes, now I know who you are. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out in 2008, particularly on the issues like moral values or cultural values. People talk about values. I was really waiting for a Democrat to say, okay, you say these are traditional family values, and I respect that. Now let me tell you what I as a Democrat believe are traditional family values. The gospel of Christ, the Sermon on the Mount, taking care of the poor. Then people say, now that's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's one view uh, that is, uh, is, is one view of religion and your role in life, and, but there's another view of religion and the way it uh, affects a person's life. And I don't think we had that, that balance or that kind of competing view, it was, okay, values, that's the Republican side, and the Democrats, well, they're good on Social Security and some other issues. Well, listening to, uh, to the Democrats begin to take that kind of thing on. Yes. With, we're listening to Hillary Clinton, for example, talking about abortion in a way that, you know, she's not calling for Roe v. Wade to be uh, overturned or anything, but she's suggesting that those people who 
uh, hate the idea of abortion are not wrong. I, I've, I've heard her say that very clearly. And Howard Dean on Meet the Press said the same thing. John Kerry met with a group of supporters after the election and said, we have to find a way to talk to people that we're just not driving away. It doesn't mean that you can't have your views and, and adhere to them uh, in, a, in a very fixed way and yet open up the dialogue and the debate. It's interesting in that every Republican candidate for president has said they support a constitutional amendment to ban all abortion, or at least, if not a constitutional amendment, that is the ultimate goal. But what they've decided to do in terms of strategy is work on so-called partial birth abortion or third term of pregnancies, uh, parental consent, do things more on the edges, which are favored by 60 to 70 percent of the American people. And it's kind of left the Democrats in a difficult situation where they're defending, quote, abortion on demand, and as opposed to trying to articulate a view, which is probably not better in some cases it may be. Uh, and in politics, uh, words are important. And the way that you are able to communicate with people is central, I think, to your ability not only to be elected but to, be, to govern. And there's, been a, there's a, been a deficit in terms of the Democrats' ability on those issues. Now, one of the things that, I, that has been very difficult in covering uh, big issues like Social Security uh, with, uh, on George Bush's watch is that President Bush has said a number of things, repeatedly said a number of things, uh, in, in which he lays out Social Security with, uh, in a way that uh, a lot of people don't think is accurate. Now, we as reporters, our responsibility is to call him on it, but then when he says it six times a day, every day for three weeks, what is the responsibility of reporters to do? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with things like weapons of mass destruction, uh, the connection between the war in Iraq and the war on terror? Well, when I had an opportunity to sit down with the president in February, um, I had expected to spend uh, probably about 15 minutes on weapons of mass destruction. We wound up setting the first half of the show. And he finally acknowledged that Yes, there were no weapons of mass destruction. And, and I but said... there might have been. Yeah, and, and, there, and they had been ferreted out. But he said, but it didn't make any difference. He would still make the same decision. And I was very curious about that because it was um, Deputy Defense Secretary Wolfowitz who said there were many reasons to go to war with Iraq, um, that he was providing aid to terrorists, that he violated the human rights of his people, but the one we settled on was weapons of mass destruction because we knew, realized we could not convince the American people to send men and women to go die without that. And it was a quote in Vanity Fair, which was very striking to me. And I, asked the, I also asked the president that day, and this was, to me, a very important moment, because I said, Mr. President, now that you've said that there are no weapons of mass destruction, in hindsight, do you believe that the war in Iraq was a war of choice or necessity? And he said, that's an interesting question. And it was, to me, it really did crystallize what the debate had been all about. Um, but to him, he, he, he really said, he said, I think, I, I believe it was a war of necessity, even with the absence of weapons of mass destruction. And I, I, knew, I knew that moment. I said, this is really something, because he now is acknowledging that he would get, wanted to go into Iraq. And he would do so even if there had been no weapons of mass destruction, which was the primary rationale given to the country and the world. Now, it took you, as you said, just about half an hour to work your way. So how do you cover it on a daily basis? It's hard because, it, you know, when the president says something, uh, you have to try to, you have to allow him the opportunity to say it, but you also have to say in your copy, if you're on the nightly news, the president said this, but, and you have to feel free to say it, Often, we will find somebody on the other side who will say, that's just plain wrong. So you have a Republican view or a Democratic view. Uh, but, you, you, for example, I asked Vice President Cheney whether there was any connection between Saddam Hussein and September 11th. He said no. He said absolutely no. And yet, if you ask the American people today, a majority still believe that there, the connection exists. And I, I actually think that if you, that, was, that was very soon after 9-11 that it's you asked five days after, yeah. Uh, and I think if you asked him a year later, he might have said that there was a connection. I did. And he said uh, it's unclear. Uh, and he talked about the whole the Czech agent meeting with the Iraqi uh, uh, agents uh, in, in Prague. 
Um, so it's an issue that you just have to keep reporting on. And, and, and you know, it's, it's very hard because people, if you're a Democrat, people will say, oh, see, Bush is not telling the truth. You should be putting him up hard on that. And vice versa. If the Democrat says something, the Republicans say, you should be. Our job is to say this is what the president said or this is what the candidate said. And if it is something that just doesn't compute with the, tr the truth or uh, it's unclear or uncertain, we have to offer that as well. When you were sitting in the Oval Office talking to the President of the United States, um, his turf, no charts, <laughs> no screen where you could put the quotes up, um, the most powerful man in the world, and he says, he said to you in that interview, I'm a war president. I make decisions here in the Oval Office and in foreign policy with war on my mind. Sitting behind his great big desk and as the President of the United States. That's, I would think that would be a bit of a daunting experience to, uh, you know, to try to keep your mind on what you're trying to do. Yeah, you have to stay focused. I had the opportunity to, uh, to interview President Bush and President Clinton in the Oval Office. And it is different than a lot of interviews. Uh, it's not someone who's a candidate for president. It is the president, leader of the free world, whether it's a Democrat or Republican. And you realize anything they say is going to have a profound effect upon what happens in the country and the world. So I think you're, you're, I, I work on those questions very, very carefully, try to be as precise as I can. I remember with President Clinton, um, I said, um, will you allow North Korea to become a nuclear power? He said, we have to be very clear about it. We cannot allow North Korea to acquire a nuclear bomb. And as soon as he said that, Back then, there were little bells on the computers. This was like in 1992 or three. Bing, bing. It was worldwide. Clinton says no to nukes in, in North Korea. It's kind of ironic now in 2005, the, Iraq, the North Koreans are boasting about it. So it's challenging, and you cannot allow uh, the trappings or the circumstances or the location to in any way uh, inhibit uh, your focus and, and questions. Uh, but you also have to walk a fine line and be mindful and respectful of the office. And I hope with both the presidents uh, I did that. Now, the 9-11 the interviews, the, the interviews in the aftermath of 9-11 were some of the most interesting that you did that I looked back at. Um, you talked to Vice President Cheney the very next week, and as you pointed out, he did say on that occasion that there was no connection between um, what happened on 9-11 and Saddam Hussein. I thought he was astoundingly candid. I mean, it was almost as if he was still in shock. Yeah. This was, it was at Camp David. And um, um, again, I was, I was driving up there. I called my dad. I said, Dad, I'm on my way to Camp David. I interviewed the vice president. He said, well, we haven't heard from the president or the vice president in any long form. And um, I said, what do you think? He said, let him talk. I want to know, I want to know what happened on that day. What was it like being in the White House? And I, boy, the instincts of my dad. As soon as I asked the Vice President one question, he said, well, let me tell you where I was, Tim. I was in my office and the Secret Service came in. They picked me up by my belt. My feet were off the floor. We went down one flight of stairs, two flight of stairs, three flight of stairs. There's a bunker under, and right now, as soon as he says there's a bunker, the Secret Service in the room are going like, you know. <laughs> and I, I almost said, Whoa. what was the code that you pushed down the wall? <laughs> And I said, what was the most important decision you made that day, Mr. Vice President? And he said, well, it wasn't a decision, it was a recommendation. But I recommended to the President, and he accepted my recommendation and ordered that if any American civilian aircraft did not turn back from the Capitol of the White House, they should be shot down. I almost fell out of the chair. It was the first time I had heard that. And I later learned that when the plane crashed in... Shanksville, Pennsylvania, there were many people in the White House bunker who thought it had been shot down by the U.S. military. Um, I, you know, just an aside on that, I don't know how much you've read of the September 11th Commission report, but those pilots, you should, if those, you haven't, you should read it. Uh, those pilots and those crew members and those passengers, talk about American heroes, they just literally fought to death to get that plane into the ground in Pennsylvania 
They were aware that a plane had hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. They knew they were headed for the Capitol or the White House, and they saved us all that anguish and agony. It's really remarkable what people did. It really is. You know, it's, it's one of the great, great unknown and challenges in, in life. How, how would you react in a situation like that? And we'll never know until we're there. Um, but in that interview, you're exactly right. The vice president talked so candidly about his emotions, what he was going through, the scarcity of information. It was unlike any interview I had ever done, um, much, much different than the one that we did five days before the war in Iraq. When I said, and I go back now and I read it, and I, I still don't know why I said it the way I did, but it was there. I said, Mr. Vice President, you said that we'll be greeted as liberators. What if or not? What if there's a long, protracted, bloody resistance insurrection? He said, Tim, you're wrong. We'll be greeted as liberators. And it's, it still haunts me when I think about how that played out. The, uh, the thing that um, I, I, was, I was amazed by that interview, and I, I must say that if you, if you all have not looked at the 9-11 report, which is, as you know, one of the few government printing office bestsellers in, <laughs> in this country, that it is, it is a wonderful thing to read in, in terms of getting a good, clear picture of what happened on that day. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the things it says in the report was that, that the air traffic controllers would not have been able to imagine that they would, would have been able to do what they did, considering the information they had, and that is to get every airliner down as fast as they did. They got them out of the area. They got them down on the ground. It was, uh, I mean, when they, when they looked at it afterwards, none of them could believe that they had actually managed to do it. And, of course, they had no idea that if they had not managed to do it, uh, they, one of those planes might have been shot, shot down. down. Yes. Um, let me ask you how you think we're doing in Iraq. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't offer my own opinions, but I can tell you what people who I trust and, and, and talk to on the ground. Um, it is still a very uncertain uh, country in terms of what's going to happen. Clearly, the turnout in the vote, uh, over 8 million Iraqis and holding up their fingers with their purple stains, obviously a very important symbol, and a demonstration that certainly in the south and in the north, there was a real hunger to express uh, a yearning for democracy, much less so in the Sunni areas. It is one of those things in, in terms of policy and politics that the, the way I've tried to cut through it with Democrats and Republicans, rather than have them argue about timetables and exit strategy, is to just be honest by saying there is only one exit strategy. The only exit strategy we have is to train enough Iraqis in the military and police forces so that we can leave. And the question is, how long will that take? But I think the deeper question is, is it doable? Is it possible? Are there 200,000 Iraqis who are willing to spill their blood for the new government? And we do not know that yet. And there are now 40,000 we know of, uh, but it's got to be five times that. And until that question, and you can't train will. You can't train love of country. It is people who have to come to it and say, this is who we are. This, I'm an Iraqi, and I'm going to die for my country. Sign me up. And as the force becomes capable of defending the borders and putting on the insurgency, America will begin to get out. Uh, and that's the honest truth and the honest analysis that I get from the Pentagon people, people on the ground, reporters, and politicians. And I, I don't know what's going to happen. And you know what? They don't either. According to uh, Andy Kohut, the Pew Center for the People in the Press, that is the view of the American people as well, that, uh, that they have, you have to, we have to give them their shot. We have to stay as long as we can, train as many people as we can, and so forth. I there was a lot of concern before the election <clears throat> that the American patience was being... Would, would run out, ...was right. being strained, certainly, and, and, and was lessening. And the White House... I know people very close to the president's thinking who said no one believed that the election would turn out as well as it did. Um, they didn't know what to expect. And now they're trying to take advantage of that. And it, I, you know, I love this idea, just as someone who loves to cover politics, 
that you're going to see the Shiites and the Sunnis and the Kurds trying to put it together. Some good old-fashioned sit-around-the-table brokering. I mean, I wish Tip O'Neill was alive right now. <laughs> we could send Tip to Iraq, put together a government. Yeah. My guess is he'd be the speaker, but that's okay. Yeah. I could just hear, hey, Ayatollah, baby, how you doing? You know? <laughs> When you look back at the 2004 campaign, how do you think we did? We, we the press, did. Um, did, it, uh, did it show you anything new about how we ought to be covering politics? Uh, yes. Uh, the most important thing we did, and we, I think we learned a lot from previous presidential cycles. Uh, after the 88 race, um, I wrote a piece for the New York Times because I said, never again should we simply become slaves or hostage to photo ops. Uh, here's George Bush at the Boston Harbor. It has to be, George Bush came to the Boston Harbor today and said it was, it was not clean as it should be and criticized my caucus. But here's an analysis of the Reagan-Bush administration's record on the environment. You can't do one without the other. And we've gotten much better at that, uh, particularly in this last cycle. The second thing we did was do a lot more ad watching, truth watching, taking the political ads or the internet ads and dissecting them and try to put them out there in a, in a form uh, that was understandable to the American people. The difficulty was that the politicians would take it and say, NBC says this charge was wrong. Well, yeah, we did, but we said the other char three charges were, were true. <laughs> and so it's, it's constantly, it's like mercury. It just keeps going across the table on you and you're trying to put it all back in the tube. Uh, I think the one thing that we also learned this cycle was that there are a lot more ads that the campaigns would say they were going to put on the air, but the only purpose in having them was having a news conference. They wanted us to put it on the newscast without having to pay for it in terms of the networks. And so we, we were quite good at that, saying to have an ad that has no uh, buy yeah, associated. Show me the buy. Show me the buy. Show me the money. Um, <laughs> And I think the last thing we learned is that uh, the information spectrum has exploded. There are the three major networks. There are the 24-hour cable. There's the talk radio. There's the Internet, the bloggers, everybody. Uh, but I think we have to be very careful that we don't become afraid of that. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's, it, is, it, is, it is what it is. It's real. And it's, it's part of our life. And the American people understand it. They know when they see someone on Meet the Press... It's different than watching someone on O'Reilly or on Larry King. They really have a very good radar detector. Um, and they know that Rush Limbaugh has a view, point of view and Al Franken has a point of view. They know that bloggers do not have the same vetting processes that we have in, in, in the tradi more traditional news shows. Uh, they know that Drudge is a, a repository for watch, looking at things and seeing whether or not they get legs. That's the biggest difference. There were... There was a screening process where something would come out, like a book, a book like the, the Swift Boat Veterans, where it would be read and analyzed and dissected, and before it made the media, uh, there would be a vetting process done by the media. Now it's just out there. And it took, it would, took several weeks for the, after the book for the major media organizations to do an analysis of it and found some shortcomings in, in the book, and some unanswered questions. No longer do you have that luxury of waiting. I think we in the mainstream media will wait, but the American public will, will, will no longer have to wait for the mainstream media. They will see these charges and the accusations made immediately. And what they have to do, and I think it have done, is say, you know what, okay, I read that on Drudge or I heard it on talk radio, but let me spend some more time trying to figure this out. One of the things that I've always thought was so difficult in trying to, to do truth squatting on ads and in, in, in other ways try to to, to hold candidates to the mark in terms of what they're saying. Uh, one of the things that I've always thought was difficult is that you can say it on nightly news or on Meet the Press or how, one time, and, but the ad is going to go on and on and on. It'll be a drumbeat. And we will all talk about it once, but it will go on with its own life. Yeah, it's, it's, it, there's no doubt about it. If, if people want to keep putting out a paid ad and repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, we can say it's inaccurate or wrong, and will more people see the ad? Probably. That's why candidates have now taken it upon themselves to respond. They have to go ad for ad. We can only do what we can do. We can cover both sides the best we can. 
but if a candidate wants to do something that is dishonest, they're going to do it. And it, his opponent will try to make an issue of it. Sometimes there are consequences and, and other times they're not. You know, it's um, when I took over uh, Sunday morning, I went to see David Brinkley, who I count in my profession and for 20 years on ABC Sunday morning. And I said, David, how, these kinds of questions. And I said, also, how do you take everything you learn during the course of a week and distill it into one hour on a Sunday morning? He said, you don't. Understand the limits of your profession, limits of your medium, television. But you still have an oasis. It's an hour, and more than most other programs have. Uh, but television seems to gravitate to conflict rather than nuance and complexity, and you've got to be aware of that. But above all else, accept your limitations. He said, for example, if Moses came down from the mountaintop in the, with the Ten Commandments in 2005, how would television news report that? Moses came down from the mountaintop today with the Ten Commandments. Here's Sam Donaldson with the three most important. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand the limits of my profession, but it won't in any way deter or dissuade me from trying to make sense of well, it. Well, I was going to say that on, that on that the program we were talking about earlier on Social Security, uh, you, uh, you backed that program up with, uh, the, with the, the back half of that program was, uh, was a discussion between Pat Buchanan and... Uh, Natan Sharansky. Uh, Nat Natan Sharansky. Uh, basically, uh, was, a, was a sort of an, an enormously philosophical and serious intellectual discussion. Yeah. You know, uh, President Bush has said that if you want to understand his foreign policy, you should read Sharansky's book, The Case for Democracy. So I went out and got it and read it. And it has a very, very idealistic view that you can... Um, go around the world and eliminate tyranny and dictatorships and replace it with democracies, you will have a terrorist-free world. The sort of Johnny Appleseed effect that the president yes. talked about in yes. his inaugural No, address. but I mean, it's a very, it's his view. And, and Sharansky went to the Oval Office, gave him the book. They really embraced, and the president believes it deeply. I was quite interested in the application of the doctrine. And um, I was reading uh, about Sharansky when he was a refused Nick. He spent eight years in it prison in Soviet Union. Terrible life for those eight years. Awful. And his wife held the flame and, and Ronald Reagan engineered a deal in which he was released. He was then Anatoly Sharansky, his Russian name. And he went to the Oval Office where he was greeted by Ronald Reagan and one Pat Buchanan, who was working for Ronald Reagan. I had read enough of Buchanan's writings where his view is very much diametrically opposed to this. He does not believe you can go around and, and, and replace tyr tyranny with democracies. In fact, Richard Nixon had detente with the Soviet Union and reached out to the communist Chinese, and that right now we're using Musharraf in Pakistan to help us on the world on, war on terror. We're using Mubarak in Egypt to help us broker a Middle East peace. The King of Jordan, the same. And there are many times where you want to have a single uh, view about human rights policy, as Jimmy Carter did, a uh, single standard on human rights, but in many times in terms of geopolitics, chess, it, it surrenders. That's the Buchanan view. And I said, what if they'd sit down with each other and talk about this? And they did. And they were respectful of each other. And it was one of the best discussions. And Buchanan, after the macro discussion, said to Sharansky, you talk about democracy. I want to talk about the Middle East and the Palestinians and the Israelis. And they both got very passionate, extremely passionate about it. Uh, Buchanan saying, how can you be for democracy everywhere in the world but not on the West Bank? And, I mean, it was, and, and, and Sharansky said, as long as they can protect our, and, and, and respect our right to exist, we were deluged with emails and letters and phone calls asking for the transcript, asking for the videotape. And it really gave me a sense that this is what television can do if you just have two people who have very strong opinions and different views who are willing to stop and let the other person respond as opposed to screaming and yelling and personalizing every discussion. I can't tell you how many times I turn off the TV. I just stop screaming at each other. What are you doing? And, uh, and it, it was really kind of a, a, something I want to do more of. Yeah. You might want to uh, get in the line if you have a question that, uh, that you want to ask, because we're going to, right after I ask this question, you, you guys get to take a turn. We're going to um, play Beat the Press. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, I, I, I suppose that the conversation with, with Mr. Cheney would come, would come very close. Was that the, 
Was that the Majority. biggest news made on Meet the Press? What was the biggest news made on Meet the Press in your watch? Uh, the interview with Vice President Cheney uh, five days after uh, September 11th, and the interview with President Clinton and President Bush in the Oval Office. Huge audiences, front plate, front page coverage of uh, interviews. And one, one other interesting interview was uh, Newt Gingrich. He had just become a uh, speaker, and he really did... <laughs> I knew it was going to be an interesting interview when we were ready to go on camera. And he said, do you know they're reading the contract of America in Mongolia? And I said, whoa, man, <laughs> this guy's a believer. <laughs> and he gave an interview. And there were, the next day there were five front page stories on five different subjects. I mean, the quotations from Chairman Newt, he was letting it rip. Uh, and that was a very memorable one. Uh, another show that I did after September 11th, at Christmas time, was with um, Rudy Giuliani, Laura Bush, and Cardinal McCarrick. And then the following year, Laura Bush and Caroline Kennedy. Both, they were totally different shows. They were not in any, no graphics or political questions. They was more of trying to take the tone of our country and talk about what had happened in, in cultural terms, spiritual terms, and both of those, in my mind, are, are uh, ones that I, I will say forever. Okay, let's start here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russer, you, you mentioned that uh, you do a fair bit of research for the questions that you pose to, your, uh, to the guests on your show. And I'm wondering if, in your experience, you've ever seen anyone accurately project a federal deficit three or four years out. <laughs> and, and, and if not, why, why does the press give time to folks who suggest that they can actually do it? Well, it's interesting. Um, the projections are not exactly on target, but the trends clearly are. They, they clearly are. I mean, very few people would say that if, if President Clinton had not reduced spending and raised taxes, there would not have been the surplus that ultimately generated. So you do the best you can as benchmarks. And, it, you know, it, it does open up the whole issue whether deficits matter or not. But you use the best information available. And if you have the OMB, Office of Management Budget of the White House, the Congressional Budget Office, and the leading firms on Wall Street all making very similar projections, I think we have an obligation to say this is the best information available. Mm -hmm. There are some people, and you, you, know, you can cite them, who will say they don't matter and this is meaningless and it's a wasted exercise. And, uh, and that view is one that you know, we've obviously put on the air. Uh, Mr. Russert, the insurrection in Iraq has been going on for almost two years now. In order to do this, it would require the insurgents to have a huge amount of supplies of arms and ammunition and perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars in financing. But I've never heard a discussion of what the source of all of that support is. And the press seems to be reluctant to attack that question. Can you perhaps shed some light on that? I actually asked uh, Secretary Rumsfeld about the insurrection, how large it was and, and how was it being funded. And I cited to him uh, a quote from the National Security Advisor of the interim Iraqi government who said that the insurrection is 200,000, larger than the American military presence. And Rumsfeld said, I have never heard that. I don't believe that. But in our experience in wars, uh, an insurrection cannot exist on its own energy. Mm -hmm. It needs to be protected and supplied. Uh, and clearly there is – some can be traced back to uh, extremist terrorists, quote, crossing over the borders into Iraq. But clearly there are a lot of people in Iraq, particularly in the Sunni areas, Baathists, Saddam supporters, uh, who are holding on and who are very much part of the insurrections. Um, we've been quite good at – in the north and the Kurdish area and the Shiite areas down south uh, – limiting it to sporadic attacks. But make no mistake about it, the road from the airport in Baghdad to the green zone where the, all the American officers and the interim government is housed can still not be traveled by automobile. Uh, and you could not do that with just a handful of people. I was, I, I was asking Secretary Rumsfeld about his comment a year ago that this was 10 or 20 dead enders uh, in small pockets. It's clearly much deeper and broader than that. Uh, and I, the election, I think, demonstrated that when there was only a – 5% turnout in some precincts in the Sunni areas as opposed to a 70% turnout. Any hint that this support may be coming from outside Iraq? Some is, sure. 
Yeah, there's no doubt, and, and we have talked about the you know, Al Qaeda presence uh, in terms of financing and support. Uh, obviously, Syria uh, has been has been suggested by this administration continues to provide uh, monies and resources. Uh, but there's also clearly some internal support for people who do not want to see the Shiites or the Kurds running the country. And on this side? Uh, welcome, Mr. Russert. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I hope that's in, in, not Bos a in Boston. Question. Sorry? <laughs> hope that's not a two page question. <laughs> Looking at your notes. <laughs> How about that? It's just a two part question. Um, the first is about. Um, your surprise, I believe, uh, that none of the moderators or questioners uh, in the last election, presidential election, asked a question about energy or environment. I thought that that was pretty, uh, if it was asked, it was rather fleeting. Uh, the city of Boston has just established a department called uh, the Environment and Energy Department. And part of it is because of the worry and concern about LNG tankers uh, in a highly populated major city. Um, on values, this is the second part, on values, um, I'm uh, very intrigued with the idea that we can bring democracy and write a constitution for people, uh, Shiites, Kurds, Sunnis, and so forth, in a diverse culture of 7,000 years old, and yet for the past over quarter century, right in the Western society's backyard in Ireland, um, can't get things straight or get an established government, even though there has been no bombings in over seven years. Finally, your point about uh, Mr. Cheney uh, being lifted off his feet on, after 9-11. I wonder how he wasn't lifted to take action since it was delegated to him by the President of the United States in May of, two, of 2001, following the Hart-Rudman warnings, saying that the attack was going to happen in the United States, and this 14-member commission included Andrew Young on the left, to Newt Gingrich, whom you mentioned earlier, on the right, unanimously. Yet the recent 9-11 Commission report says, hey, we all believed it was going to be overseas. Blame it on Clinton. They had eight years. We only had eight months. Okay. Now, I went to school, and I understand that the eight months follows eight, eight years. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, actually, uh, Hart Rudman, I had on Meet the Press to, to introduce that report to the American public. And your point is well taken. Vice President Cheney had created a task force, but it had not met before September 11, 2001. Uh, in terms of energy and questions, uh, I had a long interview with Tom Friedman on CNBC uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Friedman has written a very provocative column about energy independence, that if we're truly serious about reshaping and remaking the world and, and weaning ourselves off of oil, he put forward, a, he suggested a Manhattan project in terms of fuel cells and other issues. The press uh, has to make tough decisions in a 90-minute debate, <clears throat> particularly in the middle of a war, as to what issues are real and not real or important, not important at that particular time. I point to the 2000 presidential elections when the word al-Qaeda never came up. The word terrorism was only mentioned twice in all three debates and how quickly that changed after September 11th. So we're not perfect and, uh, and, and the candidates really do set the agenda in terms of what issues are relevant to that particular campaign. Uh, I wish we had a lot more debates, a lot more time because I think energy and ener energy independence is a, is a very legitimate issue for Democrats and Republicans to uh, share their views. Ireland. Ireland is uh, I mean, I've been there so many times myself, I have Irish, Irish background. Um, President Clinton clearly invested a lot of time in that particular issue, in George Mitchell, uh, the former Secretary of State. Uh, it, it now is, it seems to be at an impasse, uh, whether it's because Blair and, and Prime Minister Blair and President Bush have been more distracted by Iraq and focusing on that, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it, my sense is it really does take the American president and the British prime minister to really get hold and say this is going to be the top priority. And again, after September 11th, other areas sort of surfaced. Over here. Hi, Mr. Russett. Hi. Um, I'm Daniela Tucco, a senior staff writer and reporter for the Boston Tip, Tins in Print. And it's a newspaper distributed widely to all the Boston public schools. And my question for you is, um, what political issues do you think that our paper should be covering? What political issues? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the war in Iraq, 
the Social Security debate, the tax reform debate. I also think the whole issue that I touched upon lightly about partisanship and uh, the acrimony that exists in Washington. Right now we have uh, in the House of Representatives 435 seats. About 400 of those members really don't have to worry about re-election. Uh, they are safe seats. There are only 35 truly competitive seats. So you have a situation where those 400 members are much more worried about a pr possible primary in their own party. So if Republicans, you're Republican, you're watching your right flank. If you're a Democrat, you're watching your left flank. And there's really no incentive for you to go out and do something risky by compromise or consensus, something that would help you in a general election by appealing to swing independent voters because you don't have to worry about a general election. And I don't know what to do about that. But I do think it's a serious and legitimate issue. Uh, I remember a time when I watched Barry Goldwater and Hubert Humphrey have very vigorous and robust debates on the floor and then retreat into the cloakrooms and work things out. I fr watched firsthand Barry Goldwater, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, and Pat Moynihan, the vice chairman, unified together challenge William Casey, the director of the CIA, about the bombing of the harbors in uh, Managua, Nicaragua. Those are the kinds of things that are so necessary. You cannot have a government that is responsive to what is now almost 300 million people without finding common ground and consensus and respect for one another's views. And I really, really wish we'd spend more time talking about that, reporting on that, as to what has happened and why. And people will say, well, the media is part of the problem. I agree with that. Yes, I do. But that's part of your reporting. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Russert. Um, my name is Billy Glucroth. I'm a freshman journalism major at Emerson College. Um, first of all, thanks for coming to Boston on my birthday. That's nice of you. Happy birthday. Yeah. You. Happy birthday. Oh, God, no. <laughs> uh, where do I go from there? Um, I believe it was either the Sunday or two Sundays before the Iraqi election. And for me, if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. And um, for whatever reason, Meet the Press wasn't on locally, either the Patriots or the Blizzard or something at Trump Meet the Press. So I turned on Face the Nation, and on Face the Nation was John Negroponte. And at a commercial, I put on whatever that was on Fox, and they had on John Negroponte. And I caught the repeat of Meet the Press that night, and you had on John Negroponte. <laughs> and I was wondering if I could get your reaction to the impact on the public and on the media seems to be becoming more news just disseminators instead of news gatherers. And we're all just kind of reporting the same things, and we're not really expanding our views. And what, what's that doing to sort of society as a whole. Yeah, it's frustrating because you would obviously like to have a, a guest exclusively. Um, sometimes if in a situation where Negroponte, the American ambassador to Iraq, is made available, uh, they wanted to make him available to all the networks because he doesn't do it very often. And you have to make a decision as to whether or not you want to do it or not. You hope you do it differently and better. He's no doubt trying to get a, a point of view out, a message out, and you try to knock him off the spin track, if you will, and, and, and draw them out by asking uh, fair but uh, instructive, instructive and revealing questions. We, in our profession, we refer to it as a full Ginsburg. Uh, William Ginsburg, Monica Lewinsky's attorney, was the first guy to drive around to all five Sunday morning shows. <laughs> so from hence day, it's been called a full Ginsburg. <laughs> and I would prefer never to be part of a full Ginsburg. This is, a, this is a derivation of something called the full Cleveland. Yeah, that's right. The full Cleveland is a, uh, is a you know, a, so, say a hack politician in a pale blue polyester suit with white patent leather shoes and a white patent leather belt. That's a full Cleveland. <laughs> well, I'm from Buffalo. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Go Bills. All right. <laughs> Um, my name is Teresa Tui, and I got to hear you speak at Boston College about a year ago on uh, the reform of the church. My question is, um, I was frustrated with the lack of coverage during the um, presidential campaign of, um, and I heard you speak recently on morning radio about this. Um, specifically, Mrs. Hines is a really strong participant in the rebuilding of the city of Pittsburgh with her help. Uh, of the Catholic Charities and the Catholic Bishops back in the 1980s. I know that because I grew up in Pennsylvania. 
in the other part of the state in Philadelphia. I moved up here to attend Boston College 15 years ago. I I'm particularly concerned as an active Democrat on how we as a party can start talking about our faith and how it informs our policy decisions, the type of politicians we support, and the type of life that we lead. And I think that Karl Rove deserves a lot of credit for getting George Bush elected because he mobilized the Christian right. And I think the Democrats are really in trouble because we're not doing that type of work. I would like your suggestions on what people on in the Democratic Party do you think would be, uh, what steps do you think we should take in starting to talk about these issues? Uh, well, I'm not in the business of providing advice. No, I realize but, that, but, but, but you're really clear about your own faith is what I'm saying. Right, and but yes, uh, but I, I believe very strongly that what you just said and defined is a political problem confronting the Democrats, and I, we started off, I think, our conversation with that. When John Kerry said that this is the most important election in our lifetime, Republicans heard him say that as well. The view was that if there were 116 million voters, John Kerry would win. People at the White House told me if there were 118 million viewer, voters, we're not going to win. There were 100, over, over 120. I know. The Republicans turned out huge, vast numbers. Yes, they did. And the president's talking about a good heart and how about finding Christ. That resonated with a whole lot of people. Mm. Now, in my own life, I wrote this book that John mentioned, Big Russ and Me. I gave it to my dad for oh, Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I talk very openly about the way I grew up and the role that being a Catholic had in my upbringing and has in my life now, today. Right. And I didn't know how people would react to it. I, I really didn't care, to be honest with you, because I wanted, I wanted to write this about my dad and affirm his life, and I couldn't do it in a way without talk, without, and not talk about that. I have been astounded the way the book has resonated. As I went around the country, and people would be lined up and say, would you make this out to Big Mike? He's my dad. And then it was Big Fred, then Big, <laughs> then big Mario, then Big Jose, then Big Irv. And I said, I'm on to something here. <laughs> but the point was that we all have this amazing common heritage and upbringing. And whether you happen to be Catholic or non-Catholic or Jewish, it doesn't matter. People really had a, a sense of right and wrong in their families, mm -hmm. accountability, responsibility, dis discipline, perseverance, and it's nothing to shy away from. And so I, as I began to write the book, I, I began to talk about it very openly about, and I wrote a letter to my son at, at the end of it, because I, after I reread the book, I realized the book was as much for him as it was for my dad. And I said to Luke that in, in my mind that I will be judged ultimately by what kind of father I was to you. Mm -hmm. And that the same lessons that I learned in the Catholic schools and from my parents, I'm trying to pass on to you. And that you have had a life of, of, of so much more opportunity and access and privilege than I ever dreamt of, but that while you're always, always loved, you're never, never entitled. And it was the central thesis of that book. And it, it talked openly about that there's a world beyond yourself. And I, I quoted St. Luke, that to, to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm. And I, I said, if I could give you any advice when you go off to school, study hard, laugh often, and keep your honor. And as, are those values? Of course they are. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. And if people say, well, it's too religious and we shouldn't have it in the public square, people can say, I'm an atheist. I, I, I know atheists. I know agnostics. I respect them for their views. But they respect me, too. And I think the most important thing that any political person can do, whether you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, is speak with conviction and passion and authenticity. This is who I am and why I believe this. Thank you so much. Over here. My question, Mr. Russell, is about um, if I was listening to you carefully about our justification when you were talking to the president about going to war. Um, you mentioned when you were speaking to him about uh, absent the uh, presence of uh, weapons of mass destruction, there were other good reasons for going to war, according to him or people who he was speaking to with 
support for terrorism as well as um, humanitarian uh, gassing of the Kurds, things of that uh, nature. Now, last week I went out and saw a disturbing movie that perhaps you've seen or many people in the audience have seen called The Hotel Rwanda. Okay? Um, President Clinton mentioned that one of the worst mistakes he made of his administration was doing nothing in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. And my question is, if another Rwanda breaks out tomorrow and, and nearly a million people lose their lives in a matter of months, do you think that the Bush administration would go out and declare war on the offending party? That's my question. I understand. Uh, is, is the debate I have watched unfold over Bosnia? Uh, same discussion. In fact, President Clinton went to the United Nations and said, we are seeing, in effect, cleansing, and it must be stopped. The UN said no. The United States went into Bosnia without UN approval. Uh, it is what, if you go to the Sudan now, you can find this and in so many places around the world, only when it rises to the area of a crisis. Do I believe that Iraq was treated differently because of where it is in the Middle East? The answer is yes, absolutely. That's the political reality which I cover. And yet, I also know that when I first started at NBC in 1984, I was sitting with Tom Brokaw in New York, and this picture came in, a BBC report about Ethiopia, the famine. It was a seven-minute report by Michael... I can't remember, a wonderful reporter. And we sat there and looked and said, oh, my God. And we're in the 12 days, I think, out from the presidential race. And Tom said, we got to put this on. I said, let's just do it. We don't have time to get our reporters over there. These people are dying. Let's just put it on. And we put it on. And within three days, Americans contributed $65 million. That's the power you can have when you put the spotlight on that kind of crisis. So I'm not going to make a political judgment as to who would declare a war or not. But the one thing I will say is that if you have a, a passion, an interest, a concern about any place in the world or any issue, yell. Yell from the mountaintop. Let people hear it. Because it's the only way that any attention will be paid. Because so many things get caught underground. And it only will surface when there's someone there who's saying, I'm willing to take this on. And it, it's tough work. And you go back, and I was, was doing a lot of research on Martin Luther King the other day, and how many years he spent driving around from town to town with civil disobedience trying to get attention paid to the plight of African Americans. I mean, how we remember the great speech in Washington on the steps of the, of, of the monuments, but it's not the way it is. It takes a, long time, a lot of years in the vineyards, but uh, it, it should not in any way discourage you because people now with the Internet and with cable, you can explode on the scene much more quickly than you could in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Tim. Um, I am, my name is Laura Sabru, and I am also a, ten, a teen, teen in print, Boston newspaper writer for, it's like for high school newspaper. Mm. And my question would be, how can young people get more involved in political issues that concern them? Uh, by doing exactly what you're doing. You know, I, 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 I could not be the moderator of Meet the Press if I had not been the editor of my seventh grade newspaper. It would not have happened, believe me. When I <laughs> wrote that special edition about President Kennedy and sent it to Washington, you have no idea how far it was from St. Bonaventure School in South Buffalo, New York, to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I had never been to Washington in my life. I, don't, I didn't know anybody who had been except the congressman, Congressman Dulski. And suddenly we got letters back from Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, Jacqueline Kennedy, the First Lady, President Johnson saying, thank you for your school newspaper. It opened my mind in a way I never dreamt of. My God, people pay attention to us? <laughs> this is the way it is? Yeah. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who grew up in New York and then later became a Harvard professor, lived in two worlds much of his life and understood them very, very well. 
I was sitting in his office one time, and there was a big debate going on uh, with some people who had graduated. He had taught at Harvard, were now on his staff. And they were going on and on about Schumpeter and discussions of political theory and philosophy, all which were quite interesting. But I was working on a legislation which was going to get the tolls off the New York State through, <laughs> which is a big deal in upstate New York. And I was getting you know, a little bit irritated. Finally, I was so exasperated, I said, I said Senator, I don't think I'm cut out for this. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be a realist in this world and get some things done. And these guys got their heads up in the clouds and or someplace. And um, <laughs> he said, walk with me. And he put his arm around me. We walked down the hall. And he said, let me tell you something. You grew up the way you did. Your dad was a truck driver and a garbage man. You did the same job as working your way through college, driving taxis, making pizzas. But you did it because you, had, you wanted to get an education. You wanted to grow and be engaged in public life in some way as a journalist as a, in, 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 in a public office. Always remember this, he said. What they know, you can always learn. But what you know and learn on the streets, they'll never learn. <laughs> it changed my life. Thank you. I think we're getting, we're getting very close to the end here. So I think we will have just two more questions. And I, my apologies to the people who are left in line. But go ahead. Yes, my name is David Smith. I'm a professor at a, a college south of Boston. And one of the things I'd like to say is I appreciate you, Mr. Russett, for your odd questions that you ask and your candor. And one of the things that I would like to ask you is, why is it that someone, I hear you talk about uh, Vice President Sheeney and the aftermath of 9-11 and the turmoil that was going on at that time, and that all commercial flights and private fight flights were grounded around the United States. But yet I read these side stories about the Saudis leaving the country. Every one of them were ushered out with the auspices of the United States. And uh, all of Osama bin Laden's family was taken out before we could question them. And I have never heard a question being put to our president Arshini, about this, and why did they allow this to happen? And why do we tiptoe around Saudi Arabia like they are the sacred cow, and we don't put them to the task and, uh, and answer these questions about their involvement? I would ask you to read two things. One is the September 11th Commission report, which talks about this issue in great detail, because Michael Moore talked about it in his movie. The Commission report really does a timeline as to when the flights were grounded, when they were allowed to enter private airspace. The FBI insists that there were questions asked of the bin Laden family. Secondly, I had the ambassador from Saudi Arabia on Meet the Press. I implore you to read that, because I went through chapter and verse on this subject. He went to the White House the day after September 11th, smoked a cigar on the uh, Truman balcony with the president. I asked if he ever raised this subject. He insisted no. It's, it's, it's really there in the public domain. It really is. I promise you that. Okay, Thank this you. is Thank going you. to be the last question. Hi. Hi. My name is Joshua Vaughn, and um, I'm also a tip staff writer for Boston Teens in Print. All right. This is Dwight Lawrence, you know, two-part question. All right. You guys are ganging up. Double. <laughs> what is this, huh? Two against one? Ganging up. All right. Make it fast. All right. What advice do you have for young reporters on being professional when interviewing people? What advice do I have for young reporters? Yes. Yeah. And um, my question is, what was, the worst <laughs> what, what was the worst interview you ever had? What was the worst interview you ever had? The worst or I'll do this. Where do I begin? No. Um, I'll tell you the most embarrassing moment. I had um, Senator Bob Kerry, who was a Vietnam veteran, who had lost his leg in Vietnam. And he was there, and there was a big debate as to whether or not he would vote for President Clinton's budget plan. And he was concerned that he would vote for it, and then the House would not vote for it, and he'd be left exposed politically. And as my mind was racing trying to do all these questions, I began to mix metaphors. And I said, what if President Clinton put you out on a limb and saws your leg off? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and without missing a beat, he says, I've already had one sauna. <laughs> well, I turn about as red as his tie. I said, oh, I am so sorry. And he said, I own you. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> but you know, you, you make a mistake, and you just, I apologize to him, I apologize to the viewers, and, and you just pick yourself up and dust yourself up and avoid metaphors. Which is, uh, also, which is also pretty much the answer to the other question. You do yeah, the work. Yeah, you know, being a reporter, it is, it's the greatest work you can possibly imagine. It's a vocation, but it's, you can't phone it in. You got to go there. You got to come to events like this and all around the city. Don't take someone's word for it. Don't just have someone say, "Hey, this is what happened." Really? That's your view. Who else was there? Get two sources, three sources, four sources. Get both sides of the debate, both sides of the argument. Then you sit down and say, "She said this. He said this. These are the facts as we saw. The police offered this particular view." It's so important that you go to the facts. And you have to take your own opinions away if you want to be a real journalist. You have your own instincts. You have your own values. You know the way you grew up. But you set those aside and really try to get an honest explanation as to what happened. There is nothing more satisfying in the world than being in a country, one of the very few countries in the world, where your right as a journalist is protected by the Constitution. I'm on a group to call the Museum, and it's a museum for journalists. And we have the last open spot on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's 6th in <laughs> Pennsylvania. And I had an idea. I said, you know what? Why don't we put the first, the first members of the Constitution right there on the wall so when congressmen look out their windows, they see a sign of a wall that says, Congress shall make no law. Because that's who we are. People have a right in our country to freedom of speech. They also have a right not to speak. And you also have to respect that as a journalist. If someone says, I don't want to talk to you, I'm too sad right now, leave me alone, you know what? Leave them alone. That's what we are. We, we have everything available to us, and we just can't in any way abuse it by not respecting everyone's right to talk or not talk. Be fair, be objective, have fun, and keep your honor. Thank you.